the entry barrier to come into this industry is far too low. You need one unit and you're off to the races. It's your own or it's somebody else's. And that's not good to deliver professionalism over time. So you need to think nice and hard. Why do you get into this business? What do you want to get out of it? And we want to make sure that our guests and also owners are happy with what they're getting from our industry, but the opportunities are still there. It's my pleasure today to welcome Simon Lehman to the show. Simon, thank you for joining us today. How are you seeing technology involved in delivering that consistent guest experience? What are you seeing on that front? In terms of technology, what we're seeing out there, everything is available. With the technology that is out there today, it's, you just use that technology to your best possible ability and build a tech stack that serves your needs and you can automate everything. You know, let's look at the next 12, 18 months. Where do you think we are in the industry then? Yeah, that's a great question. I've been asked that many times. I think. Welcome back to SDR the Best. I'm your host, Michael Chang. It's my pleasure today to welcome Simon Lehman to the show. Simon, thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Michael. It's great to be here. Yeah, I'm very excited to have you on the show. Um, you're slightly different from uh, the, the typical guests that we have on. You have such a macro perspective of what's going on in short-term rentals slash Airbnb land, as I, uh, as I like to term it, although, you know, here in the U.S. But before we start, why don't I give you a chance to introduce yourself to the audience? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, some people call me, you know, a dinosaur in the industry. I've joined the short-term and vacation rental industry in 2005 as a CEO of probably the largest property management company in the world at the time with 24,000 units, which is now a 32,000 units called Interhome based in Europe. And uh, yeah, I've been in the vacation rental industry ever since for the last 20 years. I had many different board roles, was also on the board of HomeAway, which is now called Verbo, which is, was sold to Expedia. And uh, in 2018, um, I decided to sort of put my network and my corporate background to work as a building a consultancy firm within the vacation rental industry. So AJL is a, is a go-to partner for any stakeholder within the short-term and vacation rental industry on a global basis. We're a team of 10 people based out of Zurich, Switzerland, but we have people scattered all across, also experts we're working with across the world. And we have customers in the US, in Europe, Australia, Latin America as well. That's perfect. And I've seen a lot about AJL um, you know, within my network and you know how you and I got connected. I, I saw a post that you did on LinkedIn uh, where you advised, a, I believe, an investor on acquiring a prop tech company. And I come from a M&A background as well. So I pay very close attention to kind of who's buying what and who's investing in what companies. And, you know, AGL comes across a lot. So, you know, I'm very excited to hear your view of the landscape of, you know, especially given your experience in short-term rentals. We've obviously seen a big sea change in the industry, right? You know, there's kind of pre-COVID, you know, it was, I want to say niche, but um, at least for newer investors, it was not as well known. And, and now at post COVID, you know, the, the big increase in travel and in, in this specific type of travel, vacation rentals, you know, people wanting to travel in groups. And then now, you know, I think two, three years past the, the big COVID bump in travel, we're, we're kind of heading back to more normalized times. So I'd love to kind of just zoom out and you know, you have 20 years of experience. Like, how have you seen it kind of evolve in the last few years now? And I'd like to start kind of a little bit pre-COVID and then COVID and sure. then like where we are today in 2024. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a big question in general. Let me start with the following. When we look at the SDR uh, short-term rental industry as consultants and advisors, we are, we sort of look at the industry in three different buckets. We look at distribution. So where do I get me my demand? How do I operate? That's the short-term rental and the property management behind it. And then what kind of technology do you use to basically run my business? Because technology has also been a nightmare within the, with, within this travel vertical. It's been fragmented like hell and very hard for operators to navigate in. Uh, we're actually running a landscape of short-term rental by AGL, which is a graph that we can share with a link um, that you see the fragmentation of 22 subcategories within technology with 420 uh, companies that are providing services to the SDR industry. So what has happened over time? I think pre-COVID, uh, we saw group growth rates. We, we still were trying very hard to educate the consumer about SDR. What is vacation rental all about? You know, there, there has been studies out there, especially in, in North America, where when I started in 2005 uh, in this space, there was like 5% of travelers have used an SDR. 
And in 2019, it was 44% using STR. So it's taken us 15 years to, to get the product awareness of, of an STR or vacation rental next to a hotel to the consumer, which is not very successful if you think about it. You have large uh, online distribution platforms such as Booking.com, Verbo, Expedia, and, and also Airbnb. And then, so everybody was sort of trying still hard, getting customers and, and getting people across the value proposition. And not just guests, but also owners understanding, you know, what's the value proposition of a, of a property manager who doesn't own the assets, actually gets third-party assets to manage. And then dealing with technology, how can I improve guest experience? Get, it was all about guest experience and customer engagement and everything else. COVID hit us, which was a blessing to the STR industry, right? So now we have 80% uh, vertical awareness. So, you know, we're there now. So now everybody uh, in the world who travels knows what an STR and vacation rental is. That has good sides behind it because we've seen growth rate, rates that we have never seen before. But at the same time, we've also attracted a lot of customers who used to use hotels and now they're using STR. And if they're disappointed and the product is not consistent and, and the experience is not consistent, then we're being hammered by it because we have no brand. So let me make, and, and this is the biggest challenge if we have when you compare that with the hotel industry, especially in the US where you have large hotel brands. Nobody says, you know, I had a bad experience in a Marriott, meaning a hotel, right? It's associated with the brand and it's not about, I had a bad experience in a hotel. In our industry now, it's the bad experience with the channel and that's not good because then everybody suffers from it. And that's something where we need to think about because so far, nobody has been able to build a meaningful consumer-facing brand in this industry because we're dealing with fragmentation. We can definitely go deeper on that as well. Yeah. You hit on some great points. There's some, some great market statistics. And a couple I want to hit on, you know, one, the fragmentation, which I'm very interested in. There is, you know, here in the US, there's some very large property managers and, and some have fallen, currently fallen on hard times. I do want to hit on that <laughs> yeah. a little bit. I think second is, I've seen different stats on this, um, but I think you framed it very nicely. 2005, 5%, 2019, 44%. So it's taken 15 years to get 40% market penetration. And in the span of four or five years, you've taken 15 years and dumped that all into five years of growth. And you know, and I think that's a big part of why a lot of people are interested now as an investment opportunity, uh, both from real estate perspective and a technology perspective, you know, you have this tremendous amount of growth in a very, very short amount of time. And, you know, I think it's, you know, I think it's understandable, right? There, there's going to be growing pains in this industry. There are a lot of new people that are coming in and they're not professional hospitality operators, investors. And, you know, you have this issue of, oh man, I stayed at a bad booking.com, maybe not said as much here in the U S but definitely you get like, man, I say in a terrible Airbnb, like I'm never going to do an Airbnb again. And then us as the professionals in the space, like, wait a minute, like, you know, don't throw out the baby in the bathwater, right? Like you might have had a bad experience at this host, uh, but you know, we operate differently. And, and I think that's a conversation that needs to be had and, you know, education that needs to be had. But let's, but I, I do like, I want to, that was a big question I did ask you. So I'm going to pick them apart one by one. First, this 40% growth in market penetration in COVID. Like, how did that impact? Like, as you kind of see it from your seat in, from a consulting side, like, how has that impacted the big, you know, the big technology providers? And let's start with the big OTAs, like booking, you know, Expedia, Airbnb. Like, how do you think they've managed this growth? Yeah, I think they managed the growth exceptionally well because they were already ready. I mean, we integrated... With our property management company at the time, with 24,000 units, we were the first property management company at scale that integrated with the booking in 2007. So they loved the vertical right from the beginning already, right? So, so they were able to, they had even villas.com and then they migrated everything into booking onto one platform. They were the first ones who built a, a good algorithm mixing hotels with STRs on the search results. So I think they were more than ready to capitalize on that and just push on the Google marketing button very strong and capture this market opportunity. I mean, Airbnb was just riding this wave without having to spend that much money on Google because it sort of became the acronym of our <laughs> industry. And this was more for the long tail of, of owners, smaller property managers, one, two, three, four, five units, that for them, it was a blessing because Airbnb gave them enough 
demand and they were able to capture that because everybody just wanted to get out and not stay in a hotel. So they didn't have to do a lot of marketing to make that happen. And and I think very similarly, Verbo benefited from that more addressing families as well to say, okay, we can capture this demand now and make sure that the supply growth is there and there's an opportunity. I think this investment model came out sort of thereafter for people to say, hey, well, I can actually use you know, my own asset and, and have a higher cap rate and doing long-term rentals. And, right. and that has boosted this investment side of the business. Before that, you know, I, I always said even then, 98% of global supply that is rented on OTAs is still individually owned, right? So they, we, we see very little, you know, real estate funds, heavy, heavy asset investment funds who roll up STR with the exception of multifamily. And we've seen models that obviously haven't worked with lease arbitrage like Saunder and Stay Alfred and many others literally went bust when the demand dropped. So the demand dropped during that short period of time, but they were not able to carry that debt through before the demand came back again for this type of product, right? Yeah, no, look, I mean, I, I think there's some, that's a very good point that you bring in. I, want, I definitely want to hit on that. And then kind of the over levered from a business model kind of breakdown of, of why some of these larger players, I think, have suffered. but. Let's finish up this last thread of the question. So you think, so they've done really well, you know, they've ridden the wave over the last few years and now the wave is starting, the, the growth rates objectively have declined and, and declined materially. Where do you see some of the biggest challenges for some of these big OTAs? And the way I ask is this like from the view of, you know, if you are a supplier to these OTAs, right? You are an investor that, are, that is supplying either technology or real estate to these platforms. They are the 800 pound gorilla in the room, right? We need them to survive. Like, where do you see, you know, as they, you know, transition out of 2024 and let's look over the next few years, like, where do you see some of their biggest challenges over the next few years of being able to sustain their business model, sustain the growth? And, and having, yeah, I mean, having that's, a, the, that's a massive question. And obviously, we've been thinking about that for a long time. Also, when Google started with Google Flights and hotel ads, and is Google going to disintermediate? You know, as long as uh, Expedia and, and Booking still spends ten billion on Google Ads, they're not going <laughs> to kill them. Um, so G- Google has become less of a threat that originally anticipated or thought about. You know, they're, they're on one side they're a search engine, on the other side they're a marketing company, right? So they need to balance that with OTA. So I think that that has sort of not happened to these eight hundred pound gorillas. Second, you know, I see very little chance for anybody else coming with similar business models to sort of disintermediate and, and, and really get strong on the OTA space. I think that, that I mean, we've seen several who have tried, but, you know, these guys, the brands are too strong, their position is too strong, strong okay. uh, and profitability so, is too strong. So, so, so we're kind of living this avogopoly, right? Like we have, you know, Airbnb, Booking.com, Expedia that has, you know, obviously VRBO, you know, the old home away. And then you have this long tail of, I think, you know, to your point, people thought Google might be a bigger entrant what do you think of like you know the merit like a, you know the marriott villas and homes like you know something like an amex that's trying to get into space like some of the more you know the hotel or i guess i, I don't know which bucket to put in like the amex or the, the amexes of the yeah, world you know but amex you can wh- put where are you going to put them ota bucket uh, as well if you ask me um, um, homes and villas by married in a way as well that are an aggregator leveraging their brand to do distribution for this type of product the problem is that they deal with still the massive fragmentation at the back end of the d- delivery while they're trying to serve a consistency to their existing customers that are used mm-hmm. to uh, get consistency across across all the brands that they're managing, right? So <laughs> this is yeah. this is and this is one of the reasons why none of the large property managers in the world have been able to build a very large consumer facing brand because it's it's extremely difficult. Let me get back to the original question in terms of OTA. In terms of where we see definitely a potential threat, while we need these eight pound pound gorillas, is that you know artificial intelligence and different technologies, also blockchain with decentralized networks, I think have absolutely the potential to harm OTAs quite substantially. How do I make a contract between a guest and an owner? Do I need to go through an OTA to do that, or are there different ways, especially with blockchain technology? that we can make this happen. I mean, yes, we've seen a lot of initiatives with the travel, some ex Airbnb guys and others who have said, you know, we can build our own token and we want to have our own currency. You know, we're definitely not there yet. But I think also with AI, 
the way we consume and the way we go about travel is fundamentally changing. Are the OTAs able to adopt to that and deliver a good result? I mean, I've tested some of these AI powered search uh, algorithms and some of the OTAs and the outcome is still horrific. It's very bad. Yeah. But but uh, when we see the compounding rate of, of AI, you know, that's going to be mastered very soon. I think that's where we see some big changes. Yeah, no, I, definitely. Look, on the blockchain side, I think there's a payment issue there, but I think there's there's a payments issue that it solves, but I think there's a whole trust issue that I think is, is going to take a lot more work. I think on AI, where I personally see like more disintermediation potential is can only the the social media networks, the TikToks and Instagrams of the world. Like now, when you travel, I can only when like I'm going on a trip in Spain in two months, and you know it's not Travelocity and it's not Google that I'm looking at. I'm looking at TikTok and looking at Instagram, like the location I'm interested in, what's around there, like what are, what people posted around there, and that actually has been a lot better. You know, from my experience, a lot better consumer experience. You know, you're getting real kind of video and feedback on like hotels or places people say, you know, restaurants where it's not as linear as like a Travelocity. Travelocity is great if you, hey, I, I want to go here and I want to see some reviews, fine. But like, it doesn't solve the discovery part of it, at least for me, right? Because it's very kind of, I don't know, it's very linear. I like the the TikTok and Instagram and Facebook, you know, whatever social network that you like. I feel like that's a better way of looking. And and if they can kind of take that next step and help you go find an actual property, then I think there's potential there. But like I agree, like near term, next five, 10 years, really, really hard to break down some of these modes that Airbnb and Booking.com and Expedia have created. But to your point about like the consistent experience, right? I think that's where the next part of the conversation is the technology piece. I think we all try to use the technology, at least you know, me as an operator, we have 32 units. Like we use technology to try to streamline, like one, make the work more efficient, two, deliver a more consistent experience to our guests, right? Whether it's that before they check in, when they get in, you know, how they access the properties, you know, when they're in the properties. And, you know, you know, that was kind of how we met was when you advised, a, a, you know, one of your clients on an m and transaction. So I think you see the, the technology space in the, at a broader scale. So maybe if you can just talk a little, I know it's kind of a big question too, but how are you seeing technology involved in delivering that, consistent guest experience like what are you seeing on that front yeah, absolutely let me let me make a, a remark before i answer that you know one thing in a conversation about when we talk about the str industry on a global basis there's nothing you can generalize number one market structures okay. are different everywhere seasonalities demand supply structures are different regulations is hitting us hard so there's a lot of things so i always stay away from generalization because every market is different that's also one of the reasons why we deal with fragmentation because the action happens locally and not not elsewhere. So when we look at that in, in relation to technology adoption, what kind of tech is being used, it varies quite substantially on your business model, on your location, on your unit density, on your structure of supply. Do you deal with individual owners? Do you, do you own the assets? Do you work with institutional owners? When you work with institutional owners in multifamily spaces, you can automate a lot more then you have 500 old homes in the outer banks that you're managing or, or, or in Colorado, in Aspen, you have 60 properties, all luxury, you manage them differently. So then again, are you in the luxury space? Are you in the mid-market? Are you in the mass market? Which consumer do you serve? What are the expectations of your guests? You know, are they happy to do this? Are they happy to do that? I think we need to, like one thing that my company is all about, we want to professionalize this industry it's just to make things clear. That's what we get up every morning for. We want to help operators, property managers, short-term rental managers. We want them to professionalize uh, their business. And technology comes very, very early in the conversation. First, we talk about who do you want to be? What's your goal? Where do you want to be in three, five years? What's your positioning? What's your brand? What's your brand promise, et cetera, et cetera, to understand the business. Uh, you want to be high touch. You know, there's companies who want to do high touch. They don't want to use technology. They want to check in people personally. We had customers like that in Italy, in Tuscany, where they have a lot of American customers. The Americans love to be checked in in person to their homes when they arrive in, in Tuscany. So that's something you need to be aware of and differentiate who you are, what you want to serve, and therefore what you use technology. I think in terms of tech, we see Urban markets have obviously a far higher adoption rate of technology than, than leisure markets because of the disbursement of the units, 
in terms of home automation, in terms of visibility, what you see in the buildings and, you know, door locks, who installs them, who pays for them, et cetera, et cetera. In terms of technology, what we're seeing out there, everything is available. Like, you know, I, I always tell people, don't think about developing your own tech, even building your own PMS, your backend, the tech-enabled platform like Vacasa, always celebrated to be a tech-enabled platform. You know, with the technology that is out there today, there's Microsoft, there's Apple, there's others. It's, you just use that technology to your best possible ability and build a tech stack that serves your needs and you can automate everything. We know property managers who can automate their entire process. That's part of their philosophy. That's where they want to be. And others are ultra luxury, high end. They drive customers to their homes and, and check them in person. So, and then you need, you use different types of technologies to use for upselling, you know, additional services. You want to do. Uh, communication applications, either through hardware, you can talk to someone, you can voice use voice recognition, you can use chatbots, you can automate literally all the guest experience, all the conversations, the check-ins, the, the unified inboxes through all the different OTAs. I mean, technology is there. We are not tech people and we're a hospitality people. And I think that's something that we celebrate as well. We feel we're in the hospitality industry. So we always need to be mindful what is technology for? What does it solve for me in relation to efficiency and cost? And does it really improve my guest experience? And I always say to people, to customers of ours, put the smile where a smile comes back and put the tech where it creates efficiency and a, and a better experience. And I think that still, you know, we still need to balance that in relation to technology because I would not recommend to automate everything because we're still in the human touch business and, and human interactions are important to our customers as well. So we should be very mindful of that. Hospitality is about human beings and human capital. And that will remain that way no matter how much technology will come out there because we're still far away from any robots to clean a property. Um, so, you know, we need to be realistic here as well. Yeah, no, no it, it really, all, all really great points. It, it, you know, it comes to, where you are in a journey, like the tech stack for a beginning investor with a few units versus, you know, someone 30,000 units going to be very, very different. One of the key points that I took out from your response was no need to build every, anything yourself really in this space. So even if you're not a developer, <laughs> if you're not a tech enabled person, you know, everything is a lot of technology, that's, especially over the last five years. Like I've been in the industry now for seven years and it's just the progression from 2019, some of the, the property management systems from where they were before to now, I mean, it's it's night and day, and there's no real benefit in doing anything. The, the optimizations are: are you, you know, the right property, right? Are you the right experience? Depending on the avatar that you're serving, like where do you like? And I think that's a very important point. Like where do you humanize? Like where do you get the smile back versus where you can just deliver? And I think, I think you know, I think more for at least the guests that we serve, like they want to be pushed to information. But the the person in Philadelphia. That's coming for three days for a conference is very different from the family that's checking for two weeks in a high end villa in Tuscany. So, and so I think that's important for, you know, if you're listening to understand, it's like, who are you serving? And then, you know, that technology and the process to match that guest experience. But the technology definitely is there. And it kind of leads to, you know, the kind of the scale question I wanted to talk about before. These large providers, before I think you mentioned State Alfred, you mentioned Sonder, you mentioned, you know, there's, uh, you know, Vacasa is a large property manager publicly traded here in the U.S. having some real issues that we disclose publicly. There are a lot of other privately held property management companies, whether they own or manage, that are also having issues that aren't public and obviously won't talk names. But at least from my seat here, I think a lot of those companies said they were tech-enabled and you know would build their own systems. And I think a lot of them got in trouble because they... You know, it's hard to be a tech company and a hospitality company together, especially when things are moving so quickly. So maybe on that front there, let me talk a little bit about, I have a thesis on like this economies of scale, <laughs> when you're too big, I think it actually hurts you, especially kind of where we are in the life cycle of this industry. Like for us, we're very focused on all of our units are in two markets and we know those markets, we know the avatar we're serving and that allows us to achieve high returns. So I'm kind of curious on, you know, you see a lot of different companies, like, is there a diseconomies of scale that you see in the industry? I, I, it's a nuanced question, but I'd love to get your take. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't think we have enough time on your podcast to really get to the bottom of that question. I can say that I've been thinking about this question for the last 20 years from the moment I started in this industry in 2005. I was thinking about economies of scale and how can you scale businesses? Who is out there and who has been able to to manage that successfully? Is there a is there a glass ceiling? Is there a threshold where you know it's it's just done? And I think you've raised some interesting points in terms of scale and size and and where it potentially stops. And I think there's a lot of reasons where it is today. Let me give you one example. First of all, there is four or five very large property management companies in Europe. They've been around for sixty years plus. They have all five of them together have less than two percent market share. Number one. Mm-hmm. Number two. They are highly Sorry, profitable. Well, if I could just, what are their names actually? I think you know. I have a mostly U.S. audience, so like, what are some of their names? Or like a few of them, you can draw it out. Just so yeah, that, yeah, sure. So you know, Interhome is one. It's look. been around since 1965. Interchalet has been around since 1970. They've acquired it. It was Belle Villa at Leisure Group, which was acquired by Oyo a few years back. Uh, Belle Villa was oh, yeah, a very okay. large one, and then obviously Aways, which is formerly Wyndham Vacation Rental Europe. Uh, which was a, a conglomerate of 19 brands. It was sold in 2018 from Wyndham Hotels to a private equity called Platinum Equity. Uh, it was rebranded to Aways. They have large brands like Novasol. Novasol has been around for 70 years plus. Uh, Ho Seasons, I think 100 years, they've rented houseboats on canals in, in the UK. Uh, then okay. you have Cottages.com. You have Sykes Cottages, who've been around for decades. These five brands have together probably about 200,000 units, they're profitable. They, you know, but can they scale? Probably not. And if you look at the, the fundamentals of these businesses are significantly different as well. A Sykes Cottage is, has been around in the UK for so long. They have 84% direct distribution. They don't need any OTA at all. They can leverage the brand. They have repeat customers. They serve a domestic demand in the UK. Their properties are in the UK. These models are rock solid. They've been around forever. When in the US, and I think the first one we sort of saw was definitely Vacasa with Cliff and Eric 2012, they said, we want to build the same. And the key driver behind it is actually the technology we're going to build to make this scalable. And I think that was a total myth to make that happen. And, you know, we can talk a lot about why certain things didn't work out the way, you know, a lot of capital was was waste, the churn rate was too high, integrations were not done properly. Uh, There are tons of reasons that it didn't work out that the way they probably told their investors that it's going to turn out. One of the key elements it didn't turn out the way it turned out is unit density in all particular markets to run a profitable operation. There were too fragmented, too many markets, too many integrations. It was not, and bringing that together while you're trying to build technology, Vacasa was not capable to serve us in, the, in Europe. I happen to be uh, the former chairman of Vacasa Europe uh, until 2019. Uh, we still had to use a local PMS because Vacasa was not able to accommodate our needs in Europe through their own PMSs. So technology is a burden in the hospitality industry. It's not a value driver. It's also very difficult to, to use it as a differentiator. Technology is here to use it as an enabler. And I think everybody has now realized building proprietary tech is not giving you higher valuations. And that was where this myth came from. VCs paid higher multiples for a SaaS business than a service business. At the end of the day, if you run a full service end-to-end property management company with check-in, with cleaning, with maintenance, with operation, you are a service business that is empowered by a SaaS platform, but that does not justify necessarily higher multiples and higher valuations. I strongly believe that you're capable of building a very sizable business within the PMC space across many different markets where we're heading to. And we've seen this this scaling question I've been thinking about the last 20 years. We've seen different models. At the beginning, I was thinking of consolidation. Well, that didn't work because you still have to integrate hyper-local businesses. So by acquisition, it's not really happening. Is it by technology? It's not really happening either. Is it a franchise? Yes, it is. But why is it not the franchise? Because you have no brand. Why do you go to a franchise like a Starbucks or a McDonald's? Why do you use one of those? Because you don't have to worry about demand because it's there. The brand is there. In our industry, we have no brand. So we're seeing a lot of people who are now building franchise models, which I think is actually quite smart. You can standardize things. You can have a one tech stack at the back. You can have a brand and everything else. But what's missing for a franchisee is the brand behind it. 
So it's that's not going to be the winning model either. So we're still on the search, you know, which one is the model that can build a profitable PMC business at scale. I think some of these examples we talked about today are bad examples for the overall industry because we're answering these questions all the time. And all, especially from the US in Europe, we've seen large scalable property managers who have been profitable all the way. So it's it's doable, but you know you need to concentrate on your operational expenditure. It's a service business and your unit density and technology is there to enable your success. And I think that's, that's a great point on unit density. I'm a firm believer in unit density in my business and people that I talk to. It's like, if you have the unit density, right? Well, if you have the market, right? And that's the first and foremost. And if you're dense enough in that market, it can really drive those outsized returns. So I guess question to you then, you have to do a lot of business in Europe. And just from the names that you've mentioned, they all seem very consolidated in you know the the UK example that you that you, you mentioned I forget the name exactly but also like Science Inter Chalet colleges. you mentioned yeah, yeah. right like they have they have a particular unit type or t- particular market so is that kind of the secret or not the secret but is that kind of what was missing in some of these models in the US and that's more towards the direction of success is you know more regional more localized from a, a region or a different a specific property type like if you just do ski chalets in Colorado and Wyoming and Nevada, like maybe that's the winning model versus, you know, and not, not picking on Picasso, but there's just, cause they're in the news, like this kind of nationwide, you know, really disparate, you know, all 50 States, hundreds of markets, like that doesn't, I mean, I think that's proven to be a very difficult model to execute. No, 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 that's fine. I, I totally get it. I think we need to separate the two. So first we need to separate the ones who work in a domestic market, like a UK they're across the entire UK, Scotland, Wales, uh, England. Yes, they have been around forever. It's a long time, so it's not about speed. I haven't built that in, in 10 years and raising 750 <laughs> million in capital. They've done that over a long time. They have now third generation guests. They went there with a small children, now their grandparents and taking their grandchildren to the same uh, cottage. But they still kind of can work across different type of products across the entire nation. If you look at a Novasol and Interhome, they're serving 19 destination countries. That means 12 different languages. That means different currencies, different cultures. But they've been around since 1965, and they can address the hyper-local aspect. So the biggest question, without having to go into too much detail behind that, what's the debate behind these models, what works and doesn't, is not about is it scalable. The biggest question on larger organizations And that is a huge challenge because I've been there myself, is what do you centralize and what do you decentralize? And if you now look at the Vacasa, most headlines is people in the headquarter are being uh, made redundant. So they have taken a very centralized approach, but the action is happening locally. The owner goes to his home. You know, the people are there. So, and look, trust me, this is not easy. And I have thought about this many, many years when I was with Interhome. What do you centralize? What do you decentralize? Where can you create financial efficiencies without harming the smile for the owner and the guest? You know, we're still in the traditional business of serving guests and owners. That's all we do. And the third stakeholder is the staff. It's a triangle of stakeholders within the STR space, we have two customers, which makes it very unique because you need to deal with each customer individually. And that's also a part of the DNA. And that's something we talk a lot in our consulting work is, are you an owner-centric company or are you a guest-centric company? And what we like the most, if you're balanced. So if you're balanced, that has a direct impact in how you run your business. Which services do you have decentralized, local, where the action and the relationship is happening? And what do you centralize, like potentially revenue management, marketing, or maybe finance, uh, maybe HR and certain things are local, certain things are not local. And people think centralized reduces OPEX, but then you can't run a profitable uh, local organization because you centralize too much of the decision-making process where the action is happening locally. Because what people need to think about in the traditional short-term rental industry without you owning your asset. You're building your asset and your business on trust. Now, the question is, how scalable is trust? How many homeowners can you have to manage that trust you with their castle, right? So we always say probably about 100 owners, one, one, one manager can manage about 100 owners' trust. 
And it's not scalable because you can't manage 200 owners that trust you. So the only asset the short-term rentals industry has across the world is trust because homeowners trust them to manage their property with the exception of the one who used their own property. And that's challenging. And that's one yeah, of the reasons why this is not scalable. Yeah. No, uh, it's, uh, those are very good points. I, you know, there is a very different perspective when you are, I think we're talking about large companies here where you, you know, obviously most of these large companies are managing third party assets. You know, for us personally, you know, these are assets that we own and operate. And, you know, it's a very different, different prism of and where you look at the world when it's, you know, you own the underlying asset, you own the real estate, you don't want, you know, you don't want something bad happening to your property. <laughs> and you really have to think about it in, which is why like the Vacasa model always kind of, it was intriguing. And it's, it, it's always very intriguing to like get someone to deal with all the headaches for you. Okay. I, they get 20% of my revenue, but I don't have to think about it. And they just kind of like do it. But this is an interesting point. Let me pick this up quickly. When you look at the high level market structure, how many units that are out there? It's about 10 million across the world that we're tracking on, on, on data companies. And that's interesting over time, because when you ask me what happens, you know, pre-COVID, post-COVID, when we talked about consumer awareness and whatever, what hasn't changed is the overall market structure, which means roughly 50% of supply is individually managed on mm -hmm. platforms like Airbnb and, and, and the like. And the other half is professionally managed. Now, you're going to ask me, what's the demarcation line between professional and non-professional? We always say it's about 10 to 20. You can manage your day job up to 20. When you have more than 20, you need to give up your day job. As a rough, so we say a professional manager uh, is probably as of 20 units, he needs to become pretty switched on to run a smooth business. So, and this is interesting, that hasn't shifted substantially. You know, we think as SDR and prof professional property managers are becoming better and scalable and automated, whatever, more of homeowners will pass their units onto professional managed larger companies, but that. It's always been around 50-50, depending on markets. So. Once again, okay. you can't generalize it. Is it leisure? Is it urban? Yeah. But roughly, it's about the same. I, I think the time will tell. I think that's a very valid kind of assumption. I, personally, I think as technology gets better, I mean, look, I mean, I think the true profitability is, you know, in two ways. One, I do think owning the asset is extremely important. And it is as kind of the, my real estate investor hat on. I think too, like the technology is so good now versus yeah. like Vacasa probably had to build their own PMS 2014, but with Guesty and Homestaway and like the other providers out there, the technology is really, really, really good. And it's not that expensive, right? You know, 30, 30 bucks a list, I mean, you know, throw a dart in, on the board, 30 bucks a listing to get your listing on to a high quality PMS that has broad distribution across. Like that, that's a very nominal amount. And I do think with the, you know, it does take to your point, someone to really be switched on to your business. But if you can aggregate these technologies and own the asset, I, I do think that's, there's a lot of synergies to be had there. And then at, at a certain point, you get big enough, then either farm it out, maybe you build your own property management company like we have. I think it's still early enough where there, I think there's a lot of different paths to profitability. And, and look, I mean, this has been a great conversation. I know we're kind of running up, up on time. I think we probably could talk for hours on end. Uh, I really love your perspective and your history and industry, but I want to just kind of leave on, you know, kind of maybe set the stage for our, for our next conversation and, and maybe ask you back here in a year. Where do you think, you know, we're, we're recording this May, 2024, you know, let's look in the next 12, 12, 18 months. Like, you know, say we have this conversation in December, in the end of 20, 20, 2026, so let's give ourselves, you know, 16 months. Where do you think we are in the industry then? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I've been asked that many times. I have, Closed the conference in uh, spring of 2023, and I closed it with an umbrella on stage and said, "Guys, you know when the sun is out, you always forget your umbrella. So make sure you <laughs> have it. You have it with you. Um, not that we can read crystal balls. We were pretty right on that the market was softening quite quickly. ADRs came down, occupancy came down, supply um, grew faster than demand. So obviously, direct impact on ADR and occupancy." We've been, we've been spoiled 21, 22, 23 with pent up demand, uh, with everything that is happening, the growth rates. I think we will see more a flat movement, you know, also a higher cost of capital in terms of owning assets will have a direct impact as well. Uh, the U S is definitely different in terms of Europe where people don't build their own STR businesses. 
with buying just assets out there. I mean, cost of capital has increased and that will have an impact as well. At the same time, we're facing some pretty big unknown macroeconomical challenges right now. We have two wars going on. We have elections coming. We have maybe a third war in Asia looming as well. I mean, I'm Swiss, so I'm neutral. Um, but we're right in the middle of it as well somehow, right? With with the finances around us and you come from the financial sector as well. So, you know, I wouldn't put on my super optimistic hat right now. I would I would get people to think about, you know, how sustainable is my business? How profitable is it? How is it leveraged? How can I manage going forward with weaker occupancies and ADRs? Do I have other ways and means to rent out long-term and whatever and just keep going? But I think... You know, we have seen that in COVID. When things go well, we don't think about the rain outside. And I think that's what I urge people to think about, to have a good fallback strategy on where they're at today. And I would put more a cautious outlook to the SDR industry, but that's that's linked to the general uh, economy and travel industry and not just STR itself. I think as a business model, we're still super well positioned. We still have a lot of work to do to professionalize it and deliver consistency to our guests. Overall, I still remain uh, reasonably optimistic, but I think people need to be mindful how to manage businesses when things are not going as well as they have for the last three years. And I think that's yeah, where no, we're no, at no. In, in a year's time. Okay. So so c- keep your umbrella close. Maybe it's not open right now, but just keep it close. No, like, and, and I do think you know, like there is, there's definitely a leverage component to this business. And it's a long-term, like a business, like real estate, it's a long-term game, right? Like there's going to be ups and downs. And to the extent you built the resiliency in your business model, in your capital structure, and however you're thinking about your business, like if you're like some of the people out there that couldn't survive three months of very low demand, all right, then you got to take a look in the mirror and be like, okay, hey, what about my business? Like, how can I make it more resilient? Because like, you got to be able to survive some lean times over a months long period. If, if your business can't do that, then, you know, that's something that needs to be fixed immediately because we're going to ride through some volatility. But I think that's what you're saying. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think, you know, the industry, it's still up to the right. Like there's going to be volatility there, but there's still a lot of addressable market that hasn't been addressed yet. And there's a lot of work for the market that has already been addressed that we can make the product better and make it more efficient, make it more profitable. Um, So I, for one, you know, agree with, there's still some choppy waters ahead, but like if you position properly, you're doing the work, you have good assets then whether it's markets or clients, however, however your business is structured, I do think um, a lot of profitability I've had. And that's why we like these podcasts, Michael, and we thank you because you're supporting the industry with education. And that's what it's all about. Because the biggest challenge that we have is a closing. The entry barrier to come into this industry is far too low. You need one unit and you're off to the races. It's, it's your own or it's somebody else's. And that's not good to deliver professionalism over time. So you need to think nice and hard. Why do you get into this business? What do you want to get out of it? And we want to make sure that our guests and also owners at, at the end, institutional or individuals, are happy with, with what they're getting from our industry, but the opportunities are still there, without a doubt. Agreed. Agreed. Um, and, you know, like, this has been a great episode. And, you know, thank you for your knowledge and your time. If, if folks want to reach out to you or AJL, uh, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, absolutely. So my email address, you can, everybody can see my name. So it's simon.lehman at Atelier. Dot com, but you will find myself on LinkedIn. It's probably the best way to connect. Uh, I have a I have a good uh, base of followers, and LinkedIn is definitely the way to connect with my name and AJL attached to it. You will find me very easily. Perfect. Well, I will drop uh, the link to Simon's LinkedIn on the show notes. So please make sure to follow him and message him uh, if you have any questions and would like to uh, learn more about what AJL does. Uh, Simon, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Michael. It's been a great pleasure.